What is going on guys? This is Daniel. Game 2 between the Warriors and the Raptors was a good one. And out of everything, what stood out to me was the Warriors half court offense. In game 1, their points per play in the half court was .84, which is not very good at all. But in game 2, they managed to turn things around and score 1.07 points per play in the half court. And in this video, I want to talk about how they had more success on offense and also some of the important adjustments they made to counter what the Raptors were doing defensively. Let's get to it. The first major adjustment was Steve Kerr having enough faith in DeMarcus Cousins to start him. And this was a move I'm not sure a lot of coaches would have made with Cousins coming off of an injury. But DeMarcus played a big role. He was terrific passing out of the post and he had a nice chemistry with Klay Thompson in this game with some backdoor passes and he also added a certain level of scoring and usage that they needed with one of their stars, Durant, hurt. He scored inside and here he even hits a three-pointer. Now early on in the game, Cousins wasn't having much of an impact, and with 7.30 left in the second quarter, he was scoreless. So I thought this was a good play call by Kerr to get him involved on a baseline out of bounds play, where they run a simple set where Draymond pops out, and then they'll go high-low with Cousins ducking in in the paint. And on this play, Cousins gets fouled and he goes to the foul line. This was a very minor play, but it started Cousins' excellent night, and it's a good example of Kerr knowing what buttons to push and when to push them. Now of course, none of what he did on offense would have mattered if he was a liability on defense, but I thought he had a solid defensive night. For instance, he was stuck on a switch against Kyle Lowry a few times, and both times he did a solid job and here he stops Lowry at the basket. He also held up in the pick and roll, and here against Kawhi, he stays in front of him and Kawhi is forced into a mid-range jumper. And in general, he was pretty active defensively. Here when Siakam catches it down low, Cousins comes out of nowhere to get the block, and that's a key defensive play. Next, I want to talk about the Warriors' use of Curry as a back screener. And to give some context, let's first start off with a couple clips from Game 1. So here in transition, Curry sets a clever back screen for Livingston. And what Van Vliet will do guarding Curry is he won't switch on to Livingston, he won't help at all, his goal is to stick with Curry. And that benefits the Warriors here as Livingston is able to come off of the screen, get open, and score an uncontested layup. And to show this scheme was consistent, again in game 1, Curry sets a back screen for Livingston, and again Van Vliet doesn't switch, doesn't help, he allows Livingston to come off of the screen, though here Livingston wasn't looking for the pass, and it's a turnover. So, fast forward to game 2, and while this scheme made some sense, stick with Curry, don't give him anything, it also was an area the Warriors could game plan for to take advantage of, and that's what happened. And what they did is, they set more back screens. Here for instance, in transition, this play is very similar to game 1, Curry sets the back screen, and when he makes good contact with Siakam, and Van Vliet doesn't help or switch, Livingston gets a dunk. Also, let's watch it again to appreciate how smart and unselfish of a play this was by Curry. Now, in the flow of the offense, it's hard for Kerr to control how many times Curry sets a back screen. So what Kerr did was drop this clever after timeout set play where Curry sets a back screen. They clear out the baseline, Curry sets a back screen for Draymond, predictably there's no help, and it's the easiest basket of the night. They've been scoring layups off of this set for years, but it's been a while since they ran this set this season. But it makes perfect sense why they would bring this gem of a set out now. Kerr saw the way the Raptors were defending Curry's back screen, so he called this set to counter the defense. And inbounding it on the side, Kerr also called for a Curry back screen. The ball goes to Cousins, Curry sets the back screen for Livingston, and it's a layup. It should be noted that the Curry back screen wasn't always effective. Here for instance, Curry sets the back screen for Livingston, and while Livingston is open off of the back screen, Ibaka comes with good prompt help and Livingston isn't able to take advantage of the advantage he had. So give the Warriors credit for making some adjustments and scoring off of the back screens in Game 2. I'd expect the Raptors to adjust to Curry's back screens by switching them in Game 3, which I'd argue they should have been doing the whole series.
moving on to how in game two the Warriors did a good job of countering the Raptors ball pressure. And again some context, so in game one, one of the Raptors strategies was to apply ball pressure even to non-shooters. So here McCaw is pressuring Livingston and the goal is to disrupt the Warriors offense and make things tougher. Later Gasol denies Looney the entry pass and here the ball pressure works as it takes the Warriors out of their offense, Cook drives right and Draymond is forced into a three. And overall, I would say in game one, the ball pressure had a neutral or slightly positive effect. Here, Kawhi is pressuring Draymond, which blocks his vision a bit. And on this play, he even knocks it away from Draymond, though the Warriors get lucky and get a layup off of this. Now on to game two, I would say the Raptors ball pressure backfired. And the first way it backfired was simple, as more often the ball handler getting pressured was able to drive to the basket and score. So here Iguodala, a not very good shooter, is being guarded tight on the perimeter and he makes the defense pay by driving to the rim and creating a layup. I thought the Warriors were more mentally prepared to handle the pressure and here Draymond does the same thing as Iguodala. He's pressured a bit so he drives to the basket and he scores. This time, it's Cousins who's pressured far from the basket, and he drives by his man for the bucket. This play is another example of how the Warriors were able to counter the Raptors applying ball pressure to the mediocre shooters. And the play is simple. Curry curls off of Bogut, his gravity forces Ibaka to help, and this frees up the alley-oop to Bogut. When we watch this play again, we see that the presence of the ball pressure had an effect. So if Kawhi, say, was off of Iguodala five more feet at the foul line, then he would have been able to stunt and stop Curry when Curry catches the pass. This would have allowed Ibaka to stay home on Bogut, and all Toronto would have given up is a three for Iguodala. But it's important to note that this doesn't just happen. This was a set play where each player was put on the floor in the perfect spot. Iguodala, a not very good shooter, is the passer, and the Warriors knew that with the ball pressure, Kawhi wouldn't have helped off of Iguodala. Draymond is also high on the floor for a reason. This is an unnatural rotation for Lowry to rotate over to Bogut, so by having two of their non-shooters up high on the floor in this action, the help is tougher for Toronto. Where the help would normally come is from Powell in the weak side corner, but notice who he's guarding, Clay. This is a tough rotation considering the gravity Clay has, and that is what freed up Bogut for the dunk. So that's one of the disadvantages of ball pressure. You can't provide as much help to the Warriors screening and cutting. And here the Warriors do pretty much the same thing. This time it's Clay who curls off of Cousins. Siakam was applying ball pressure to Livingston so he can't help which forces Ibaka to help. And notice how Cook, a good shooter, is in that weak side corner keeping Van Vliet out of the paint. Van Vliet is slightly late on his rotation and Cousins gets a layup. So those were two nice plays which took advantage of the Raptors ball pressure, though here without a set play the Warriors are also able to take advantage. Curry cuts to the foul line and the only reason this pass is possible is because Kawhi is up on Draymond. Curry catches it and this helps break down the defense. So should the Raptors apply less ball pressure in game 3? Well not necessarily. Ask the Blazers, they did not apply ball pressure and they still got killed because the Warriors have an answer for anything you try. So here for example, Myers Leonard is doing the opposite of the Raptors, not applying any ball pressure to Bell, and this allows him to take away some screening action and cutters, and here on this play he takes away the backdoor cut from Clay. But the Warriors have a counter for this too. Bell dribbles into a pick and roll with Curry, and because Leonard was so far back, he's unable to get up to the level of the screen which is necessary to guard Curry, and he ends up fouling Curry for a 4 point play. So if you don't apply ball pressure, the Warriors will hurt you with screens like that. And also without ball pressure, that allows their high post passers to be more comfortable. And here the lack of ball pressure allows Draymond to make a difficult pass to Looney. Well, there you have it guys. In game two, I thought Kerr made several good offensive adjustments and called some great plays. And we'll see how these factors play out in game three. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.